What's going on ladies and gentlemen, my name is Michael and welcome to Fudge Muppet. I've asked you this question every video, and yet again I hear no reply. I suppose you prefer silence then. As do I, my dear child, as do I. For is silence not the symphony of death, the orchestration of Sithis himself? Ironic, then, that I come to you now as speaker for the Dark Brotherhood. My name is Michael from Fudge Muppet, and my voice is the will of the Night Mother. She's been watching you, observing as you kill, admiring as you end life, without pity or remorse. The Night Mother is most pleased. That is why I stand here before you. I bear an offering, an opportunity, to join our rather unique family. However, it seems there has been some kind of dragon break, allowing you to throw yourself into Cyrodiil during the Oblivion Crisis or Skyrim during the Fourth Era, Year 201. Do you have a preference? Oblivion is the first Elder Scrolls game I was introduced to all the way back in 2006, and it holds such a special place in my heart. It's hard to resist the fairy tale charm of the world, which at times could make you forget that there are some very dark moments in the game. But today I'll make sure my nostalgia goggles are removed so I can be as objective as possible as we explore none other than the most iconic Assassin's Guild. I'm proud to present the next addition to our Skyrim vs Oblivion series, The Dark Brotherhood. Spoilers warning of course, and what better way to begin than by comparing how you join the guilds in the first place. You sleep rather soundly for a murderer. That's good. You'll need a clear conscience for what I'm about to propose. There's nothing quite like the eerie voice of Lucien Lachance, who appears at your bed after you've taken your first innocent life. Lucian gives you the option to join the Dark Brotherhood and gives you a dagger known as the Blade of Woe. You must travel to the Inn of Ill Omen, find a man named Rufio, and kill him. You track down Rufio in the basement, and if you choose to talk to him and accuse him of having done something wrong, he says, No, please. I didn't mean to do it, you understand me? She struggled. I... I told her to just stay still, but she wouldn't listen. I had no choice. When Lucian next appears, he is very pleased. He sends you to the abandoned house in Chaden Hall, which you make your way through until you get to the black door and use the password you've been given to enter the sanctuary. A secret society is revealed to you. You meet Ochiva, who gives you your armor, as black as the void, and directs you to Vicente Valtieri, a vampire who will handle your initial assignments. Vicente explains how contracts work, and how you can fulfill special client requests to earn valuable bonuses, such as unique magic items. In Skyrim, you'd remember that to join, you must first steal a contract from the Dark Brotherhood, helping a young boy in Windhelm to kill Grelod the Kind, a cruel, abusive woman who runs an orphanage. The boy, Aventus, is performing the Black Sacrament, and thinks you're the assassin from the guild when you show up. After doing the deed, you receive the infamous letter with the black hand that says, We know. Next time you sleep, you wake up in an abandoned shack, east of solitude, to a very chill Astrid, clad in aesthetic Dark Brotherhood armor, keen to tell you that you must take a life. There's three bound captives with sacks over their heads. You must execute one of them, or all of them, if you wish. Each has a bit of backstory if you want to think about your choice. After you've done your slaying, Astrid gives you the password to the Falkreath Sanctuary hidden in the forest. You go there, get your own set of armor, and get sent to take care of some routine assassination contracts handled by Nazir. You also meet the rest of the family, and can learn that the Night Mother's corpse is on its way to the sanctuary. It's also worth adding that before you get to this point, you can complete a minor quest related to it called Delayed Burial, where you find Cicero transporting the Night Mother near Whiterun, and convince a farmer to help repair his broken wagon wheel, or turn Cicero into the guards. To pit Skyrim against Oblivion here is quite hard. The Dark Brotherhood contact you meet in Oblivion, Lucian Lachance, speaks in a way that is much more captivating than Astrid, and if you explore both of them throughout their respective plots, I'm sure most would agree he is more interesting. I also prefer how the Oblivion quest has you approached by the Dark Brotherhood to do the quest only if you already show yourself to be a murderer, making it feel like you're a better fit for the group. In Skyrim, you can just hear about Aventus and go get his quest, which perhaps you would justify because you can go find out just how evil Grelod is. 
On the other hand, joining the guild in Oblivion is as simple as kill any innocent, sleep, meet Lucian, go to a fairly standard inn and kill Rufio, an old man. Skyrim is far more cinematic by comparison. A child doing this dark ritual with a skeleton and other body parts laying on the floor, killing Grelod in her orphanage, receiving a mysterious note, sleep, and then getting kidnapped. But more than that, you're taken across Skyrim and wake up in some abandoned shack in the middle of nowhere. To escape, you must kill at least one of three masked captives. I think if I try to be the objective here, Skyrim actually seems to have done a better job. There's just much more involved in the joining process, and I'd say Lucian is what carries the Oblivion opening majorly. Both intros are really good, but if I'm being as objective as I can, I'd say that Skyrim wins in this category. But let's go through the storylines and the quests themselves. You'll notice that Oblivion and Skyrim are structured quite differently. Generally speaking, Skyrim has the assassination contracts given by Nazir, which function as a kind of side thing to do in conjunction junction with the main quest, whereas Oblivion feels more like the assassination contracts are the main quest. Let's begin by delving through Skyrim. So you find the sanctuary, put your get up on and proceed to meet the family and hear them telling stories of their latest contracts. There's a whole colorful cast of characters and eventually you make your way to Nazir. He gives you three contracts, although you only have to complete one and then return to unlock the next quest. Each of Nazir's contracts involve a distinct character to assassinate. However, these targets are not heavily characterized and feel somewhat generic despite not being radiant. So the setup of doing these quests in between main missions isn't as bad as, say, the Companions Guild, where you actually are sent to do Radiant jobs. These are more unique than that, but they just don't carry much weight. The three contracts you get from Nazir are to take out Nafi, Anodius, and Betild. Nafi is a beggar living in some ruins just outside the village of Ivarstead. He's sad about his dead sister, so it's not exactly an epic kill. He's quite secluded, too. Anodius is a super paranoid Imperial who used to work at Angus Mill but has moved to a nearby camp. He fears someone is out to get him, and you fulfill that prophecy. He's also far from any guards. Finally, there's Betilde, who is a more complex job as she lives in Dawnstar and runs a mining operation, competing with her husband, who she separated from several months ago. Taking her out requires a little more brain power, which is good, but again, there's not a whole lot to it. It feels just how it was designed, as a side thing separate from the main. As I said, you only have to do one contract and return in order to get your first main mission, which has you handle a request for Muri, a Breton lady in Markarth. And after doing your first basic side contract, contract and returning, you'll notice that Cicero the Jester Assassin has arrived with the Night Mother and is causing quite the stir. After visiting Muri, you learn that she was very close with the Shadow Shield family of Windhelm until a sweet talking bandit, Elaine de Font, took advantage of her while she mourned Frigga Shadow Shield and stole a family heirloom. The Shadow Shields blamed Muri and forced her out of the city. Now she wants revenge on Elaine, but also wants Tova, the mother of the family, to suffer even more by having her second daughter, Nilsine, killed. Elaine is holed up in a Dwemer ruin and taking out Nilsine is an optional objective. Killing Elaine is not the worst quest, but as the first quest in the Dark Brotherhood, it's a bit dull considering it doesn't really involve many assassin themes. The quest could have easily been from a Jarl telling you to go kill a bandit leader living in some ruins, and you just run in with a battle axe and do it. The optional objective, however, can really make you question your actions, as Tova can be found dead in the bedroom of her home in one of Skyrim's most tragic scenes with a farewell note about losing both of her daughters. I'll link the video I made about why Windhelm is the most tragic scene city in the description for more on that. After you return to Astrid, she's growing worried about Cicero, who has been locking himself in the chamber with the Night Mother's coffin and whispering to someone. You're sent to eavesdrop by hiding in the coffin itself, which has you discover that Cicero has been trying to talk to the Night Mother. Instead, she talks to you, telling you to travel to Volenrude and speak with Armand Mottier. You're named the Listener by Cicero, which those who have played Oblivion would remember as the highest rank in the entire guild. Astrid, of course, won't treat this as legitimate and affirms that she's still the leader. She wants time to process everything, so she sends you to Nazir for more contracts. This whole event is technically the second main quest, even though you don't really do much, and it's needed from a story perspective, but all it does is have you stand in a coffin in the faction headquarters. Nazir gives you two more contracts, or tells you to finish the previous ones if you haven't, because remember you only needed to do one to progress before, and you actually only need to do one again. You can go and do the second contract you never did and come back to get the next quest. If you're doing all of them, the next two are killing Hearn and Lurbuk. 
Hearn is a vampire living with his wife at Half Moon Mill. It's a simple lonely life and therefore like many other contracts, a super straightforward easy kill. Lerbeck is a funnier one, he's a terrible bard who you'll need to silence permanently. Going back to the sanctuary, Astra agrees you shouldn't ignore the Night Mother, so you're sent to meet Armand Motier. Like the other main quests so far, this one also doesn't have much in the way of assassin themes, although the conspiracy you hear of is very cool. Volnrood is filled with Draga, but you can just go straight to Armand as he's in a room near the entrance. He tells you he has a bunch of targets planned out for you, all of which make way for a final one, the assassination of the Emperor. He gives you an amulet to use to pay for expenses and a letter detailing what he requires. It all excites Astrid who has you take the amulet to Delvin Mallory of the Thieves Guild who is happy to buy it. Mottier seems to be a member of the Elder Council looking to climb higher. As per the letter, your first task is to attend the wedding of Vittoria Vici and assassinate her. Now this is obviously a really cool quest and fits the bill for how the Dark Brotherhood faction should be making you feel. There's all sorts of ways to take out the bride. You can do it in the open in front of everyone, you can hide and shoot a long shot from afar remaining hidden, or my favorite, you can sneak above her on the city walls and push one of the statues from the top, which if done at the right moment will crash down and do the dirty work for you. The guild's shadow scale, Vizara, will then charge in and initiate combat, drawing attention away from everyone so you can escape. Astrid rewards you with some gold and the ability to summon the ghost of Lucian Lachance, which is a nice little easter egg. The next quest has you kill Gaius Maro, the son of the commander of the Penitus Oculatus, the faction who will act as security for the Emperor in Skyrim. You need to plant a letter on his body, framing him as plotting against the Emperor. The cool thing about this quest is that he travels all over Skyrim depending on the time and day. You can steal his schedule from Dragon's Bridge to track him down and take him out. You can actually provoke him with dialogue too, making him attack and the guards will come to your defense if you're in a city. As a bonus, killing him in a city has the benefit of rewarding you with Olava's token as a reward, which gives you a little side quest to locate an assassin of old, ultimately getting an upgraded version of Dark Brotherhood armor. Returning back to the sanctuary, you find out Cicero has gone haywire and attacked everyone, and after reading his journals, you go to Dawnstar's abandoned sanctuary where he has fled. Astrid gives you Shadowmere to use, which is cool but doesn't feel as cool as it did in Oblivion, Arnbjorn, who pursued him, is injured outside and says Cicero is hurt too. When you make your way through and find Cicero, he is curled up on the floor, but if you try to kill him, he leaps up, revealing he was pretending to be dangerously wounded. Alternatively, you can decide not to kill him, which is actually recommended by the ghost of Lucian should you summon him. I also agree with keeping Cicero alive. Returning to Astrid and saying Cicero is dead, you get your next assignment. You must assassinate the famous chef, the Gourmet, and take his place, so that you may poison the Emperor's meal while cooking for him. You track down his identity by intimidating a chef in Markarth who knows more about the Gourmet, and then you take him out to tie up any loose ends. The Gourmet is an orc who is staying at Nightgate Inn, a secluded location in the Pale, far from civilization. Kill him however you please. He likes to stand over the pond outside, which is great considering you'll need to hide his body and can just shoot him into the water with an arrow, otherwise you'll probably find him in the inn cellar where you can drag him into a large barrel or behind the haystack. Stack. Take his writ of passage and then for your next quest, you're sent to solitude acting as the gourmet to prepare a meal for the emperor. You pop on your chef's hat and can select a number of strange ingredients if you so choose, including a septum, to throw into the broth when talking to the chef helping you. At the end, you can throw in the jaron root to poison the meal. Ultimately, when the emperor dies, or so you think, it turns out this was a double. You flee and are confronted by Commander Morrow and a bunch of his agents, who explains that someone in the Brotherhood sold you out and that he won't uphold his end of the deal to continue to let them operate, seeing as you killed his son. The whole city is after you, so you escape and finally make your way back to Falkreath Sanctuary, where Festus Crex is already pinned to a tree by arrows. You go in, seeing the members of the faction being cut down, and try your best to keep them alive. You help save Nazir, and as you run past the room with the Night Mother, she calls out, telling you that hopping in her coffin is the only safe option. You do so, hear explosions from outside, and the coffin is thrown through the glass window. Nazir opens the coffin and you come out and the Night Mother tells you Astrid is still alive. You find her in her chambers, stretched out on the floor and burnt very badly. It turns out she sold the guild out as she wanted things to return to normal before Cicero, the Night Mother and you showed up. In her last moments, she has performed the Black Sacrament on herself, which you can fulfill with the Blade of Woe as an option which is placed next to her. You return to Nazir and Babette, the only survivors, and the Night Mother tells you to meet Mortier in Whiterun and proceed with killing the Emperor. And so begins one of the 
coolest quests in all of Skyrim. In the Bannered Main, Mortier reveals the Emperor is on his ship near Solitude's docks, and also that Morrow is outside the East Empire Company warehouse at the docks if you want to kill him too. You can do that however you like or not, but the real prize here is the Emperor. You sneak aboard the ship, dodging the sights of each and every bodyguard or fighting your way through. Entering the Emperor's quarters, Titus Mead II will greet you. He accepts his fate to die by your hand, but requests you kill the person who plotted this assassination. Take your time to soak in the atmosphere after finishing the job, before escaping from his quarters out into the open where you will escape into the water. Meet back with Motier and receive your massive 20,000 gold reward. You can kill him if you want to fulfill the Emperor's desire. Returning to Nazir, you can keep the gold or use it to restore the new sanctuary in Dawnstar. You've finished the main plot now. The new sanctuary even upgraded can feel a little bit empty, but at least Cicero will be there to spice things up if you spared him. He'll be your follower if you want him to. The Night Mother gives you a never-ending miscellaneous quest for random assassinations, and Nazir still has the contracts you haven't finished. Of those we haven't discussed, there's an Argonian Dicus camping near a shipwreck, there's Mirandru Joe who just travels around with a Khajiit caravan, there's Anariath who just lives in Whiterun, but it's slightly more fun because you may have actually met this character before, and now someone wants him dead. There's also Agnes, an old lady in Fort Greymore with only a dagger and some clothes to protect herself. The final three contracts are somewhat better but still nothing particularly memorable. You go to a Dwemer ruin to kill a rogue mage, Malaurel, who is doing research into dwarven artifacts, then go take out Helvid, who is the house call to the Yarl of Falkreath. I like that one just because it's more of a high profile target in a place guards could catch you. For the final contract, you kill a pirate, Safia, who is also boarded on a ship outside Solitude. Unfortunately, her crew won't actually attack attack you if you're spotted, and just say you're not supposed to be there. Find her and take her out. You can even make her initiate combat and her crew won't come to her aid. Overall, the Dark Brotherhood side contracts can be fun, but they aren't particularly great. I do wish there were more contracts in the actual main story, instead of it quickly revolving around the plan to kill the Emperor. But let's turn our attention to Oblivion. After making your way into the Chaden Hall Sanctuary, you're sent to Vicente Valtieri, a vampire, for your first mission, the assassination of Gaston de Sword. Gaston is the captain of the pirate vessel docked in the Imperial City's waterfront district. You can always find it there with pirates out the front who instantly attack anyone who sets even one foot on the ship. After surveying the area, you'll notice that you can actually stow away in one of the crates being loaded into the ship, and so you sneak over, crouch down, and decide to hide inside. If you go this way, you then find yourself inside the ship, where you can sneak past the pirates on board and make your way up to the captain's quarters. You take him out and quickly loot the room as the pirates outside start banging on the door. You've got to get out of there, so you dash out of the door onto the balcony and leap into the water. It may not be as epic as assassinating the Emperor in Skyrim, but for the first contract mission in Oblivion, it's super cool. Going back to Vincente, you'll be given the Black Band, a special ring that fortifies light armor security and magic resistance. For your next quest, you're sent to kill an old wood elf by the name of Banelin. He lives in a nice house in Bruma with a strong Nord servant, Grom, to protect him. If the target is old and weak, then his manservant is sure to be quite the opposite. You'll get gold for the kill, but if you take him out and make it look like an accident by having his mounted minotaur head fall on him as he sits in his chair, then you get a special reward. You also shouldn't kill Grom, as then it wouldn't look like an accident either. The special reward is an elven dagger known as Sufferthorn, which damages health and drains strength. You can enter through the front door, though it's hard to avoid detection, or you can use the secret basement entrance from the rear of the house. Inside, you'll make your way to the upstairs level where you find a secret door leading to a crawl space. You can use it to loosen the fastenings of the mounted head at the right time to have it fall on the relaxing Bosma, killing him. Avoid Grom as you leave, who will be standing by Banelin's dead body. Later, if you're thirsty, you can find him drinking his sorrows away at the local tavern. At this stage, Vicente rewards you and makes you a slayer, which is the rank above murderer. There's many ranks to hold as you progress through the faction, which makes the pacing feel more gradual and you have a better idea of where you stand as you climb your way upwards. The next quest is one of the most iconic as it has you go back to the Imperial City prison where you begun the game and originally escaped from. There's a memorable Dark Elf prisoner doing time in his cell opposite yours when you start the game, and he will deliver some unique insults to you depending on what race you chose to play. Well, this taunting Dunmer is about to meet his end, and you'll get to savor some sweet revenge. You sneak in through the sewers and do your best to get past all the guards in the Imperial subterrain. This can actually be quite a stealthy challenge, but you'll want to adhere to this approach to get the reward 
which is only received if you kill no guards. You get a miscellaneous item known as the Scales of Pitiless Justice, which increases your strength, agility and intelligence, but also reduces your personality whenever it is in your inventory. After keeping to the shadows skillfully enough, you'll be able to make your way to the Dark Elf's cell. You can kill him with an arrow or get the key to his cell and open it. It's one of the most satisfying quests in the game and it's so cool that you got to go back there and otherwise would never know the opportunity existed. From here, a side quest becomes available from Tinava, so long as his disposition is greater than 70. He is Ochiva's twin brother and also a Shadow Scale. He explains that a fellow Shadow Scale, Scartail, violated their code by fleeing Black Marsh and refuses to return. Shadow Scales cannot kill their own kin, so he sends you to bring back his heart. You can go take him out next to his camp southeast of Leowen, where you may notice he has been injured after killing another assassin sent to get him. You can also agree to bring back the other Argonian assassin's heart, and he'll tell you where some of his treasure is. As a reward, you're given the boots of Bloody Bounding, which fortify acrobatics and the blade skill. Vicente's final contract has you visit Coral to help a man who has borrowed too much money from underworld types and missed the payment. They want him dead and are sending an enforcer. You're there to fake his death. You use a dagger coated with a special poison that makes it appear as if someone is dead. You also get an antidote to revive him later after he's been taken to the chapel undercroft. The man's name is Francois Mottieri. Familiar family name, I know, although they seem to pronounce it as Mottieri more in oblivion, as opposed to Mottier. After breaking into his house and finding the panicked Breton, it's not long before the Argonian Enforcer arrives. You do your assassin act, slash Mottieri and flee from the Enforcer. Returning to the chapel a day later, you apply the antidote and revive Francois. Unimpressed, Mottieri's zombies begin to attack you and you leave, taking Francois to the Grey Mare Inn to buy passage out of Cyrodiil. Just don't let him die as you can actually fail the quest. Speaking of failing, if you break one of the guild's five tenets in Oblivion, you get exiled and a wraith. The Wrath of Scythus attacks you in your sleep, and you must defeat it to be allowed back in. Your reward for this quest is the unique amulet Cruelty's Heart, and the Sanctuary Well Key so you can enter the Sanctuary more conveniently. You advance to the rank of Eliminator, and Vicente gives you the option to accept his dark gift and become a vampire, which I think is just so cool. You're directed to talk with Ochiva from now on, who sends you to the Imperial City to track down a High Elf named Phalian. Phalian must be killed in a secure indoor location with no witnesses to receive your bonus. This is a simple but funny contract. You need to speak to any elf in the city and have one with a high disposition tell you that Phalian lives in the Tiber Septum Hotel. You go there and learn he was once a wealthy nobleman but wasted his fortune on Skooma. His girlfriend lives there who he visits and can tell you that Phalian visits Lorkmere's house in the Elven Gardens district at 11am and leaves at 5pm. It's his secret and quiet place to enjoy Skooma in peace. You can run into Phalian at the hotel and he is one spaced out elf. Hey! Hey! How... what are... Uh, what are you... doing here? You're not my... not my friend? What? You know, what, what... what do you... want? But to kill him privately, you'll want to head to Lorkmi's house while he's there, pick the lock and take him out. Alternatively, you can give him some skooma, perhaps sourced from his supplier in Breville, and he'll give you the key to the place. After killing him, you can find Lorkmi's dead body in the basement, which explains why the place is abandoned. For your reward, you get gold as well as the unique bow, Shadow Hunt, which damages health and magicka. You're then sent to discreetly kill an ill man at Fort Such, Warlord Roderick. You take a bottle of poisoned medicine, sneak in and replace his normal medicine with it. Doing so while remaining undetected will yield you a unique reward, the Deceiver's Finery. This set of clothes boosts personality and speech craft. You can travel in the main entrance or use a secret entrance and go through some tunnels to get there. After you switch the medicine and escape unseen by his patrolling guards, you return for your reward and are given the next quest, which is one of my favorites in all of Oblivion, Who Done It? The Who Done It quest has you sent to Skingrad to attend a house party at Summer Mist Manor. When you arrive, you're greeted by a guild assassin posing as a doorman. You get the key and are told that you cannot leave until everyone inside is dead. You only get the bonus if you're not observed killing or suspected as the murderer by the other guests. Except the very last guest alive, of course. You can slowly pick off one target at a time, manipulating them and turning them against each other as they greedily look for the treasure which they think they're there to find, boosting their disposition and using items like the Deceiver's Finery to raise your personality and speechcraft is quite useful. Each guest has a unique setup. In the 
sense of who they are attracted to, like, dislike, and sometimes even hate among the other guests. You'll use this to your advantage. You can have Devesi Dran excited that Primo is attracted to her by putting in a good word for him, and she runs to wait in his room where you can take her out. You can send some guests down to the basement to die there, and if your disposition is high enough, you can have them kill each other as you convince them to gradually become suspicious and fearful of one another's motives. Each has their own little backstory and unique personality, which make completing the quest in different ways so satisfying. After taking out all the targets, you'll get your gold, and if you earned the bonus, you'll be pleased to know that it's the Night Mother's Blessing, a small but permanent boost to your acrobatics, blade, marksman, security, and sneak skills. Next, you're sent to take out Adamus Philida, a pesky Imperial Legion officer who was a nuisance for the guild but has now retired. You're given a special arrow called the Rose of Sithis, which has been specially crafted to kill one person, who is in this case Philida. You'll need to hit him when he's not wearing his armor, so your best bet is to wait until he takes a swim in the pond in Leowin. You'll want to stalk him a bit to figure out his schedule there, and then pick your vantage point to take the shot. Alternatively, you can hit him with the arrow when he's unarmored in his barracks while he sleeps. You'll want to take his finger with the signature Imperial Legion ring attached, and then sneak it into his successor's office desk in the Imperial City. After getting your gold reward, you may visit the city to find Philida's bodyguard dead, with a letter explaining that he took his own life after failing in his duties. You also now advance to the rank of assassin. Next, things start getting serious. You receive a letter from Lucien Lachance. It turns out the Black Hand itself has need of your talents. You travel to Fort Farragut, where Lucien is residing. His letter says not to tell anyone in the sanctuary about it, and reaching him through this fort will see you fight your way through many undead guardians and traps. Lucien reveals that there is an assassin among the assassins in Chadenhall Sanctuary, and that being a new member, you are not a suspect. However, you must now kill every member of the Dark Brotherhood. You are now exempt from adhering to the Five Tenets as long as you serve the Black Hand, and you are now referred to as Silencer. This is a pretty hard-hitting quest, especially having done quests for and just spent time with other members of the guild. Lucian gives you a poisoned apple which you can use, and a scroll to summon the ghost of Rufio, but you can kill the members however you want. Poisons, stealth attacks, all-out combat in the open, or going nuts with frenzy spells. It's particularly interesting to note you can reverse pickpocket garlic onto Vicente the vampire to significantly weaken him. Talendral may be in the sanctuary or travel out of the city, meaning you may have to hunt her down, which you can do with a note found on Ochiva's corpse. Overall, it is a tragic quest, and even the Khajiit who was always rude to you has grown kind and now considers you a friend when it's time to end him. Ah, there you are. Uh, look, I've been thinking, and, well, I guess I just want to say I'm sorry for the way I've treated you in the past. Some people speculate that Lucian had you complete the whodunit house party quest as practice for this mission, but we'll never know for sure. Upon completing the purification, you begin to receive your contracts from Lachance in the form of dead drops. Each location is revealed after you complete the previous contract and also holds your reward. You're given the steed, Shadowmere, and your first dead drop location. There is a hefty total of seven dead drop quests, each giving you targets to kill. Each target is special and uniquely characterized, and taking them out makes you feel well entrenched in your high rank within the guild. After traveling into the mountains and finding a hollowed out rock, you get your orders to assassinate a necromancer who is trying to achieve lichdom. He carries a miscellaneous item that appears as an hourglass known as the Sands of Resolve, which he's using to achieve his goals. You can sneak into his lair, pickpocket it from him to kill him instantly, or try to assassinate him the traditional way. You get the next dead drop from a sack near the roots of the great oak tree in Coral. Your target is an entire family, the Draconis family to be exact. You travel to the farmhouse, Apple Watch, to slay the mother of the family and find a list of her children's whereabouts. There's Matthias Draconis, who lives in the Talos Plaza district of the Imperial City and works as a guard in the basement of the Umbacano Manor during the day and visits the bloated float inn in the evening. There's Celia Draconis, who is actually quite the high profile target, being the captain of the guard in Leowin. She's quite sturdy and is most vulnerable in her private room at the Three Sisters Inn at night or the cemetery behind the chapel. Andreas Draconis runs the Drunken Dragon Inn northeast of Leowin. Deal with him however you like. Finally, there's Sibylla Draconis, who has actually decided to live in a cave, Muck Valley Cavern. She's very aggressive and has some animal companions too. After killing all the members, you get your next dead drop orders from the well in the courtyard of Castle Skingrad. You're sent to take out Jagasta, a powerful Khajiit boxer 
who is said to be expecting you. He lives and trains in Bruma, and according to your notes, he has bribed the guards to ignore the fight if it spills out onto the streets. His training room is in his basement where you can slay him. Once this is handled, your next dare drop is below the old bridge south of the Imperial City. The target is an Argonian named Charlize. Charlize is hiding in Flooded Mine and happens to be a psychopathic killer, so you'll want to be very careful. She has an enchanted sword that kills fast and will not hesitate to try to fight you in the water if that's where you take things. Your next target is Alval Uvani, a powerful destruction mage and merchant. After getting your dead drop orders in a coffin found near the entrance of a fort, you'll want to use his schedule to track him down and remove him. He travels all over the place from Breville to Skingrad to Bruma and to his house in Leowin. You can kill him however you'd like and can even trick him into drinking mead in a variety of ways which will paralyze him as he's allergic to a key ingredient, honey. A hollow tree stump in the market district of the Imperial City carries your next orders which send you up a snowy mountain near Bruma. You're to kill Havelstein Horblood, who supposedly killed a Mead Hall chieftain back on Solstheim and the victim's sister wants her revenge. Taking out this barbarian and his wolf companion named Redmore is not meant to be easy, but if you calm while he's asleep then you won't have much trouble. You travel to an Aelid ruin to get the next dead drop which tells you to kill a wood elf in Breville by the name of Ungolum. He visits the lucky old lady statue you every night, and similarly to Jagusta has paid off the guards to avoid getting involved. As soon as you've accomplished this, Lucy and Lachance will confront you, and he is not pleased. It is now revealed that from Jagusta onwards, all of those targets have been high-ranking members of the Dark Brotherhood. Lachance thinks you've been purposefully taking out these members of the Black Hand, betraying him, until he sees the confusion in your eyes, and realizes that someone else must have taken over the dead drops and begun to mislead you. The real traitor is clearly still at work, and now the listener of the guild, Ungolum, is dead, as are many other speakers and silencers. You go to Anvil and wait near the next dead drop to find who the traitor is. A wood elf comes over and places the orders inside a barrel, and after confronting him, he says that a man staying in the lighthouse is paying him to do it. Going to the lighthouse, you head to the cellar to find a very disturbing scene. There's dead animals, dead people, and even the infamous severed mother's head. The traitor's diary is found down here, and it turns out they have been a member of the guild for a long time since Lucy and Lachance killed their mother as ordered by a contract. The traitor has been waiting for their revenge and is slowly having it all unfold. You then go to meet Lucy in an Apple Watch only to find him killed and mutilated in a most intense fashion. The Black Hand believed him to be the traitor, tracked him down and created this disturbing scene. They all seem to have enjoyed it thoroughly so any of them could be the real traitor. Arquin, another member of the Black Hand, promotes you to speaker in Lucian's place, giving you a set of Black Hand robes. Now you must travel to Breville with the remaining members to speak to the Night Mother. You go to the lucky old lady statue and Arquin recites an incantation, revealing the secret entrance to the Night Mother's crypt. The Night Mother is summoned and the traitor reveals himself, killing the rest of the members except for Arquin before you can react. His name is Matthew Bellamont, and you help Arquin defeat him. With the traitor finally removed, the guild can finally rest easy, though it is no doubt weakened greatly. The Night Mother explains that she knew of Bellamont's intentions, but did not inform the guild as she considered them incompetent, particularly on Golem, and that it was foretold all of this would lead you to her, to become the new, better listener. The Night Mother also powers up your Blade of Woe and allows you to take what you will from her crypt. It's not the most epic ending to a faction quest, but it still works well with what's been happening so far. As the listener, you can get a quest from the Night Mother each week to report a target to kill and their location to Arquin. They're all outside of Cyrodiil though, so you're simply doing your job as the listener and aren't actually killing them yourself. Arquin now takes up residence in the Chaden Hall Sanctuary, and a few new members will join but like in Skyrim, many cool characters have been killed by the end of the faction storyline. Speaking of characters, both games have some pretty memorable ones in the family. Oblivion has Antoinette Marie, the Breton Assassin, Vicente the Vampire, the two Shadow Scales, Ochiva, Entinava, and the Wood Elf Archer, Telendril. There's also the Orc who loves killing without stealth, Gogrun Grobolmog, and the Khajiit Mage, Merchant, and Assassin, Mirage Dar. He's rude to you until it's time to kill him. The Chain Hole Sanctuary is also home to a Dark Guardian and a rat named Schema. There's Lucian, of course, although he's not in the Sanctuary, and there's Arqua 
Harlequin, who's there after you finish the story. You'll also have three generic Dark Brotherhood murderers join, a Khajiit assassin, a Breton mage, and an Imperial archer. Oblivion Sanctuary was also pretty cool looking, and there's no doubt it's all very nostalgic for me. Oblivion's face zoom in also makes NPCs even more memorable in general, but I'm gonna be honest and say I think Skyrim wins in the characters and guild environment area, if I try to be as objective as I can. You're probably very used to seeing the members of Skyrim's Dark Brotherhood, and it's easy to take them for granted, but if you think about it, they're quite well done, and I think if you had imported their aesthetic, personality, and their backstory into the Chadenhall Sanctuary back when Oblivion first came out and that's when you met them, I'm sure they'd be even more memorable to Elder Scrolls fans. Take Arn Bjorn, for example, a werewolf and ex-member of the Companions who left after they eventually found his methods too unsettling, or Babette, a 300-year-old master alchemy trainer and vampire who still exists in the form of a little girl and is satisfied greatly by tricking targets and killing them. A friendly frostbite spider Liz can be found hanging around her in the alchemy area. There's the mysterious Nazir, who grew up in the deserts of Hammerfell and dresses the part, and of course Skyrim has an Argonian shadow scale too, Vizara. There's Gabriella, the Dunmer assassin, and Festus Crex, the elderly mage, who experiments with magic and managed to turn someone almost fully inside out with a new spell. There's also the guild leader Astrid, and while she's a traitor, she's still a good character, and the moment you wake up in that abandoned shack with her is really cool. And finally, of course, there is Cicero, a jester-themed assassin with a very interesting backstory and an absolutely mad personality. Luckily, you get to keep Nazir, Cicero, and Babette alive in the endgame, and then like Oblivion, you can also get some new generic recruits. While the Chadenhall Sanctuary is cool, the Falkreath and Dawnstar Sanctuaries do look much better. This is understandable, as usually a more advanced game with new and better technology tends to lend itself to more varied and interesting location layouts. Skyrim also has more post-game content in terms of assassinations and even being sent to find treasure from tortured subjects. Technically, being able to deck out the Dawnstar Sanctuary with Delvin and transform it into something really cool is also a neat feature that Skyrim's Dark Brotherhood experience has. So, who are we going to pick as the final winner here? I would love to know your decision in the comments below. For us, it's about the journey, not the destination, if you know what I mean. Skyrim may have a slightly cooler cast of characters overall, and a better endgame setup, and a very cool final mission quest, but for the most part, the main experience begins with nothing that fun, and then quickly revolves around this plot to kill the Emperor. Many quests don't involve more traditional assassination jobs either. The actual feeling of being an assassin just doesn't feel like it's there at all times, and of course, you're the destined listener from the get-go. While Astrid still leads, this plays into the issue found in many of Skyrim's guilds, and that is that you advance so fast or are quickly seen by someone, whether it's the Sigic Order or the Night Mother, as special. Oblivion's ranking system helps give the player a stronger understanding of where they stand in the guild at any given moment. You slowly ascend the ranks as opposed to being told you're the chosen one from the start, and almost everything you're doing feels like you're fulfilling the main function of what an Assassin's Guild should be. Taking out targets is at the forefront of the guild quest and isn't relegated to a side task like the less memorable contracts Nazir gives in Skyrim. So instead of doing some more boring contracts on the side that don't feel impactful and don't raise any kind of rank or reputation in the guild, and getting thrown into the Emperor plot right after you quickly deal with Muri's quest, Oblivion just keeps this constant focus on memorable quests and targets that are fun to take out. Skyrim does have that neat beginning with the kidnapping and the epic climax at the end, but the meat of the plot and the faction is tastier and thicker in Oblivion, and I feel that that provides for a better experience as most of your time working with the guild feels richer and makes you act like you're meant to as an assassin. Not only did you have this feeling of really earning your stripes, but you were getting unique rewards for fulfilling bonus objectives, and if you lay it out on paper, there was also just a really large volume of this good content. The faction plot is just chock full of well-characterized targets and fun missions. Also, the whole idea that you have to take an innocent life on your own volition before joining is sensational. And that, ladies and gentlemen, wraps up Skyrim vs. Oblivion The Dark Brotherhood. Thank you so much for watching all the way through and for listening to me talk about two of my favorite games for so long. It's always so great to reflect on the idea that there are thousands of people out there who love this stuff as much as we do. Social media links are in the description if you're interested in following us on Twitter, as are the links to our other videos in this series. My name is Michael, thanks again for tuning into Fudge Muppet, and I look forward to nerding out with you again very soon.